My name is Aidan Cronin. I work for Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy in Denmark in the Corporate Technology Department. Uh, I'm a member of the ETIP Wind um, Executive Committee. The main focus there is on interfacing with the European uh, Union on all matters pertaining to research and innovation and wind. Um, and you can, I'm representing ETIP Wind today. Uh, and you can read more about our work on the uh, etipwind.eu website for those of the, you that are interested. Um, you could say when we take research and innovation, they've delivered great feats in wind. Uh, the megawatts wind class uh, was actually uh, initiated by, by EU funding. Offshore wind was considered fool's gold. Uh, when you look at it today, it, it's a completely different, uh, what you call, uh, kettle of fish. Uh, floating wind uh, is currently considered the, our new madness, but when you take uh, take the fact that if we crack floating wind, then we open up 11 times more offshore wind resources to deliver green power to 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 uh, to uh, the energy transition. Uh, you could say, looking forward, we have the confidence of having one of the world's largest uh, what you call wind or uh, energy resources be behind us. But we need to move into new areas. We need to move into storage. We need to move into uh, that's electrical storage, into hydrogen, into ammonia. We need to start storing heat and also coal storage. And if we if we manage this, then we actually we, we expand our market, uh, what you call it, uh, exponentially, and we use every last kilowatt of green power that's produced. And 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 in in terms of conscience, we, we have to do that. Um, if you want to taste within, in, in, in the area of innovation, uh, um, what they call what's happening, you should look towards the, the, uh, the, the West of the Wind Energy Scientific Conference, and that's happening in Hanover next year. I attended last year in, in, in Ireland, and it was fantastic to see this artery of knowledge which is feeding the development of our, our, our industry going forward, all the young talents, all the new ideas, all the networking, it's a fantastic forum, um, and, and uh, we're very proud that it's supported by the, the, uh, the European Union. It's a little bit like going back to university and meeting your best professors for a week. Uh, research and innovation, however, has its challenges. Uh, one example has been SciTech in, in Spain that unfortunately lost the prototype. Happily, they're, they're up and running again, and they've got EU finance to continue their 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 efforts in delivering some interesting offshore results. I think our motto in, in research and innovation it has to be that if you fall, don't wait to get up. Uh, we need this. We need resilience. We need clever people. We need good engineering. We need sheer stamina. And if we do all that and fuse it, then we deliver to the deliver to the needs of the energy transition. Uh, in retrospect on what we're doing today, many years ago at the American Wind Energy Association, they had this uh, section down in the cellar where for $100, uh, a lot of inventors could come and show their wares, and you had all sorts of, of people. But in my time in wind, I, f I found some very novel and creative and, and, and good uh, uh, technologies there. And you could say that this is the modern, uh, the modern equivalent uh, when I was at, at, at Aviate, it was always the best part of the show because you had all the corps uh, doing their stuff, but talking to the guys who were in their garage messing around with, with vortex generators, etc., that was always probably the most exciting part. In this forum, we also hope to highlight technology being developed from big and small actors alike. That's without prejudice or judgment. Each technology should be seen, seen as its merits and should create the needed creative excitement in our audience. Um, I'm delighted to say we have a broad selection of technologies, and I'll present them in quickfire succession after this brief, uh, brief introduction. All these sessions are pre-recorded, which I think you're aware of. Um, questions will be answered by the presenters in real time on the chat section. Um, uh, so please be concise and respectful in, in, in your questions. Um, I'll now run through the different titles. Um, of what's going to be presented and by whom, and then when I when I finish that, then we'll go directly through to the videos, which will come in in rapid succession of each other, uh, and there will not be any roundup. The roundup, I think, is is a bit superfluous in this forum. So to keep things easy, what we will do is we'll just uh, we'll just when the 
you, you just engage on the chat forum what the questions you need answered from the different participants and and uh, then we then we'll we'll when the last video is over then the the the, uh, the forum will shut down um, yes if we look at the presentation the first one will be from Xavier Ioldi is the director of Concrete Towers of the Nordics Group. He make a presentation on mobile uh, concept for towers. Uh, this can be a key technology to drive local content and employment at local level and replace difficulties of transporting large tower sections. And Nordics has been known for many years. They, they have an excellent design team from their Gamma machine, which I remember many, many years ago. So we can look forward to that. Then we have um, Xavier Callan, program manager at Nabrawind. He'll take presentation of segmented, segmented blade technology. And this, of course, again, is very interesting, not only in terms of reducing transport for, for larger blades onshore, but also in terms of, of replacing parts of the blades in, in midlife and whatever, uh, should it need be because of damage, uh, lightning damage or whatever. Um, then we have uh, Paxi Bernard, research engineer at STA in France. He'll present uh, robotics technologies from aerospace to wind, and robotics are a very, very hot topic, especially when it comes to offshore maintenance uh, and re reducing uh, turbine downtime, downtime, and that's especially offshore, that if we can have a, a sort of a, a, a human-controlled robot that can go in and fix small problems, then, and, and this is especially offshore, that we could reduce the amount of times we have to visit, visit turbines, and that can bring down the cost dramatically, and also robotics to perhaps keep an eye on what we're doing, especially when there's high voltage involved, so we reduce uh, the chances of, of accidents. Then we have Pedro Pinto. He's the CEO of FiberSale. He presents real-time blade condition monitoring, knowing what's going on, why, and what its impacts are on machines. This continues to be a challenge for wind, so, so that's, that's an important. Then we have Natasha Medlin. She's Corporate Relations Manager and Lake Parime, and they'll present the power box, and that's introducing modular data centers. In light of the increased concerns of cybersecurity, some modular systems, uh, uh, what you call modular data centers, uh, uh, placed strategically in different regions could heighten the cybersecurity of our entire uh, data and internet. Uh, we were to have uh, Dr. Chan from Inyang uh, but unfortunately, we've had a problem with the audio feed. So uh, in terms of that, what we will do as soon as we, we solve that, we will mount the video so you can look at it uh, afterwards because uh, I think we will, the videos will be up for, for a long time after this conference. So unfortunately, that, that wasn't possible with Minyang. And again, uh, seeing the, the pivotal, pivotal uh, what you call it, uh, place of China, it, it's quite sad. We, we like to promote China and all, all what's happening there. So, 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 yeah, but that will be mounted. Then we have Corwind. Uh, they have a concrete-based floating sub substructure concept. That will be uh, uh, Jose Luis uh, Garcia. He's the group leader of power systems at IREC. And, again, of course, the optimization of floating is vital for the success of offshore. We need one, two, or three standardized solutions that we can run out uh, over, the, over the entire world. And then having that, having the, the econom economies of scale, will be able to drive down the the, uh, the the price of wind. Then that will be followed by Dr. Jose Manuel Martin of New Ohio. He presents reducing rare earth uh, content and magnets. And of course, this is a very sensitive area. There are only so much. There's so much. There's only so much uh, 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 rare earth resource in the world. And any optimization we can do there is vital to deliver the sustainable growth of our industry going forward. And then finally, Iona Karagali, senior researcher at DTU, will present on using uh, satellite data for wind applications. It's always interesting to see how we can use what you could say in place technologies in new ways to deliver better wind, wind solutions. So there we are. I hope you enjoy the presentations. And remember that innovation is what makes wind even more relevant in building a sustainable, balanced world for our children and their children and generations to come. So now to the videos. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am Javier Alvarez, Concrete Tower Business Unit Director, part of the Nordes Group. 
I will try during this session to give you an overview of the concept of mobile factories that we have successfully developed during the last 10 years. For those who are not familiar with the concrete tower, let me briefly explain it. The concrete tower is composed of individual precast segments, commonly known as keystones. These pieces are manufactured in the mobile factory, which is usually located close to site or even inside the wind farm. Keystones are transported to site on a just-in-time basis. Once on site, we pre-assembly the keystones conforming sections. The vertical join between segments are grouted. Sections are lifted one on top of the other, as it is done with the common steel tower. Horizontal joints between sections are also grouted, and post-tensioning cables are installed to give more stability. The Nordest group has quite a good background with concrete towers. As you can see, we have set up more than 20 factories along the last 10 years. In Europe, Asia, America, Africa, Nordes has manufactured around 2,000 towers worldwide, meaning a total of installed capacity of 6 gigawatts. Let's explain the two types of factories. First one, existing facilities. Buildings that, that can be in use or not. It's not necessary to be a factory use for the precast concrete sector. Only installing cranes, molds and batching plant, towers could be manufactured. These factories are usually located close to site. Second one, pure mobile factories. The one set up on site, starting from scratch. In this case, full installation are required, starting with land leveling, concrete slab, structure, anti-cranes, offices, warehouse, storage yard, laboratory, and so on. For water supply, we install an hydraulic circuit with tanks. Diesel generators are used. A key point of this model is to have every building or mean as modular as possible, considering the restriction of the maritime containers that will allow us to move this factory from one side to the other of the planet. Very relevant is the demobilization of the factory. Environmentally speaking, it's crucial to leave the land in the same condition as it was before the project. This is a process with its own procedure at all, but it's not all about business, but about sustainability. Why concrete towers? First of all, steel towers are not cost-effective above 120 meters. Second, stability of concrete prices. As you all know, steel prices are very volatile. Third, concrete allows to go into bigger tower diameters, and bigger tower weight requires a smaller foundation. And why mobile factories? First of all, cost. The reduction of the logistic cost and risk probably is the main driver. Second, local content requirements in several countries. And third, local economies and communities development. Jobs creation is one of the strengths of this business model. Is it really competitive to set up a factory for each project? The answer is yes. However, some factors need to be considered. Move and the move must be a standard process itself. Every single step of the factory construction must have its own procedure and its risk analysis. As mentioned, the factory needs to be easily transported. Being able to fit into maritime containers is a must, and this needs to be considered since the very beginning when designing the layout and the means. Reusing the factory gives us the possibility of applying amortization policies that reduce the final cost of the tower. But we also have some non-reusable capes in the factory. This is impacting on the cost in the first project, but to really become strongly competitive in future projects delivered from that location. As an example, Brazil and Mexico uh, are factories running since 2014. What about the labor? Is this, this concept easily implemented? The answer is no. It's highly necessary to have a global team of experts that helps local teams during a period of four or six weeks Around 200 employees per factory are hired. It's not a complicated process, but people need to be trained. But trainers are not enough. Manufacturing procedures are also required. The process must be robust. How? Making it as simple as possible and using different mechanisms to avoid human mistake. Process engineering and lean manufacturing are also the key of this model. Having said that, 
it is true that each country, each region is different. Cultures, labor regulation, unions, many boundary conditions that must be considered when planning this type of factories. Depending on the local regulation, even the layout of the factory or even some processes needs to be adapted. That is why it's very, very relevant the local research and studies when tendering this product to our customers. Multi-contract model is something between the turnkey and the own manufacturing is also a good option when entering a new country. Going hand by hand with the local company gives you the expertise and detailed knowledge of the market. What about future developments? Could we implement this model for other winters? Absolutely yes. Nacelles, blades, halves could fully or partially be manufacturing these temporary facilities. Main capex use of for towers could be reused in the case of nacelles or blades, for example. Other potential use could be manufacturing precast foundations. Some O and M have already constructed this type of foundation. In this case, it's even more obvious that synergies could exist with a concrete tower factory. So these mobile factories could be multi-product. Why not? As you can see, Nordes has done it, and it's for sure ready to improve it. It's a matter of having processes and the right human team. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Good morning to everyone. I am uh, Javier Cayen. Um, I am the project manager in uh, Navarra Wind Technologies of uh, Navarra Joint. So I would like to present today our solution. Uh, let me uh, have a short introduction of our company. Navarra Wind Technologies uh, has been is working on the development of advanced wind technologies for the wind industry. And, and we've been working on a couple of lines of development in the last five years. And we are already working on the first commercial projects on both of these. The first of them is uh, Navra Joint, which we will be presenting today, and we have a couple of uh, additional products, the Navra Leaf and the Navra Base, the self reacting tower and a new type of uh, foundation, which we are already uh, installing in the first uh, commercial wind farms. And uh, with that, I would like to move to the part of the market, which uh, uh, is the target or the, or the aim of, this, uh, of our products. The uh, clear uh, trend on the market is the growth of the blades, and it is expected also to be seen in the next years the uh, growth, the continuous growth of the of the blades, uh, so, which is going to impulse also the split blades into the market. This is uh, one of the predictions. So, in that sense, we have developed our solution, our modular blade system, which is a, a modular solution which we can adapt to any blade in the market. We can integrate that. It is typically focused on blades longer than 70 meters, and we can reach any length. We can adapt to any type of, of blade structure. Basically, our solution consists on a voltage connection. You can see here the details in which we have uh, metallic inserts bonded into the, into the composite, and we are connecting each part of them by a single stat, which is one of the key characteristics of our solution. This is, allows us a, a, a reduced uh, mass and size of the connection. You can see here that one of the single elements we are working with, that, that's uh, an insert here, an insert here, and a, one single stud in the center, and the block is connected by means of an expansion, one of the uh, uh, patented device we have developed for this technology, which allows us to apply the required potential in the solution and to maintain them during the operation of the, of the blade. You can see here how it works. We have the upper and lower wedges of the expansion and their central stack. And by applying the vertical load to these wedges, we transform that to the required level of pretension that the joint requires. And then we can lock the device. It works as a solid block. We can maintain the tension and the pretension of the stack during the whole uh, life without any needs of uh, retightening. With this, uh, considering this single element and, and considering its design allowable, which we, saw, which we have obtained during the certification product uh, process of, of our technology, we obtain the number of elements uh, which we need in each, sec in each section to cope with the load requirements of the blade in that section. That sizes the, this part of the, of the solution. And then we have to define also the integration in, with the rest of the blade, the, resulting in this part, which we are manufacturing in our plant, and we are delivering 
to the blade manufacturer to be integrated as a procured part during the shell manufacturing. The blade is manufactured as a standard blade, and then once it's finished, you can disassemble that and send to the site to complete the, the installation of the wind turbine. You can see here the real aspect of the parts we are manufacturing, here in the carbon fiber version, then the pre-assembly, and finally, the assembly of, our, of one of our prototypes to complete the, the integration into the blade. We can see here also the uh, key characteristic of our solution. The first of them is a cost-effective solution. We have uh, gone to a high strength stat and to increment also the high strength of the of the bolded insert to assure that we have a high load carrying capacity of the individual elements. And then we can minimize the number of elements we need in each section to cope with the load uh, requirements of the blade. This, together with the reduced size of the, the spacer and to the, the use of one single spacer, or one single stud, sorry, allows us to minimize the metallic parts and to reduce the joint mass, to reduce the joint uh, load impact in the blade, and also to reduce the, the cost of the, of the joint. Uh, following with the assembly, uh, we have developed a solution with a fast assembly. Uh, both bleed models require very simple coordination, so with simple tools and with some uh, simple uh, equipment, we can uh, complete the assembly and, uh, and uh, assure also a quick tensioning of the solution with some automatic tool we have pretension. You can see here an example of, the, of it. It is a reliable solution. The voltage connection is uh, simple, robust, and maintenance-free. It has been con conceived as maintenance-free, and the behavior itself of the of the spacer allows us to to have a, a maintenance-free uh, voltage connection, which is uh, one of one of the key parts of the of the solution. And finally, it's a first-class technology. So we have certified that according to the IEC standard, completing the previous tests you have seen in the in the previous slides with some segment tests in which we testing in static and in fatigue the, the full-scale solution before going to the, to the real blade projects in which we are involved now. With that, we are able to propose a, an alternative for segmentation allow the blade, so, uh, resulting in different sizes of the, of the joint in, in which we can uh, optimize the mass and cost of the solution to the requirements of the of the blade in its uh, in its uh, manufacture or in its uh, in its point, and we are also able to offer a family of uh, of uh, elements from ranging from M33 for M42 to assure that uh, we can offer uh, for the different requirements and the different locations around the blade the more optimal solution for the for the using the cost and the LCOE of the of the solution. Finally, uh, we are presenting a modular blade solution, which is uh, commercially available. We are already working on the first commercial project, and we are able to offer that on as an off-the-shelf solution to work together with the manufacturers in the next generation of blades, facilitating the entrance in the market of the modular solution. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. I would like to uh, answer any question you may have about our technology, about our product. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. The goal of Durable is transferring aerospatial technologies to the renewable energy sector to EM supervision and maintenance. This project is financed by the Interact Atlantic Area Program through the European Regional Development Fund from the European Commission. The total budget is nearly 4 million euros. 15 partners are involved into this project. Four countries are represented, France, Spain, England, and Portugal. We count five academic entities, two technological centers, two clusters, one startup, one industrial, and two industrial end user. The technological approach, Okay, one, collect and analyze the needs from the industrial end users. Two, develop the solution to optimize the supervision of the wind and solar farms, and also for the maintenance and reparation aspect of the equipments. Three, on-site pilots for testing the developed solutions. Okay, 
Interesting point about the joint mapping event. It brought together 175 attendees from uh, 15 countries. It served as a framework to exchange demands and technology offers for inspection and maintenance of solar and wind infrastructures. In the resulting catalog, companies can identify the last technologies, their benefits, technology uh, uh, readiness level, and directly obtain the contact of the developers of each technology in the Atlantic area. Fadaka Tech, with the participation of El Universidad de Sevilla and University of West England, have been working in the design and development of advanced autonomous functionalities for unmanned aerial systems or drones. Right now, Dura partners have started to test these technologies in a controlled environment. In Durable, team of UAV and UVG cooperate to achieve a more dependable autonomous operation. UVG provide mobile power researching stations for the UAV. They act as repetitor of wide area wireless communication networks. Obviously, they can perform inspection operation themselves. Fadakatech together with Lortec and Dublin City University are working in the development of drones, especially designed to be used in the following inspection use cases. Non-destructive inspection without contact using visual and infrared cameras, non-destructive inspection with contact using ultrasound and AD current techniques. The adaptation of these inspection methods and its implementation will be analyzed and collected into a catalog of capacities for inspection services. CATEC has developed the first aerial robotic system with an arm and advanced manipulation capabilities to be applied in inspection and maintenance activities for renewable energy plants. These tests were performed in CATEC test band installation. This approach led to omit expensive and dangerous human operation in field that are not easy to access. STI is developing a virtual cockpit to remotely control robots, both UAV and UVG. We are exploring the use of the 3D to enhance the supervision and the control of the vehicle, especially by using 3D map. STI works with uh, University of West England to control the developed drone. We are also exploring the natural interaction to enhance the pilot experience. Here you can see um, a video demonstration of the, the current state of the, the developed uh, cockpit. So we have a drone in the hour in the loop uh, simulation uh, configuration running on um, on um, RCM engine. We have the virtual cockpit running on Unity. And so you can see we can develop a really rich environment with a 3D map to follow the drone and also have a really rich and, and complex environment to, to control uh, the, 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 the robot. As you can see, at the current state, uh, we are uh, we are able to to fly in uh, in simulate, and in the, the the next weeks, we will start uh, the the real fly. So I'd like you enjoy the simulation fly. We have also additive manufacturing aspect. An hydraulic manifold for the yaw brake of the wind turbine was printed by uh, SLM by Lortec. Two redesigned from the conventional hydraulic block were developed. A significant weight reduction, about 70%, uh, was achieved with both designs, and the performance of the component was ensured. The goal of this step is to demonstrate the maniability of a wind turbine blade by abrasive water jet. 
This technology is used on the carbon fuselage of the Airbus A350. The test on the Dura project should make it possible to find the machining parameters for the removal of the top coat and a fiberglass ply on the wind turbine blade supplied by Parlement. The goal here is to demonstrate the feasibility of the teleoperation of a BM robot as Fort Uwada. To achieve the task, we use the data collecting thanks to a body motion suite, and we are developing a strong algorithm to transform them in the goal of controlling the robots. The project will design pilot operation accounting for the final technology used and tested in the overworld package and the characteristic of the host, wind and solar installation. Thank you for the listening and I uh, will be glad to answer to your question. What if we could monitor the full condition and performance of each of these rotor blades anytime? Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Pinto. I'm the founder of FiberSail and we are making this possible. At FiberSail, we believe that blade deflection monitoring will pave the way for a far more competitive wind industry. These giant blades have huge deflections, but if these deflections differ from each blade, it will cause extra loads and vibrations contributing to underperformance, failures, and unexpected maintenance. Last year, these unexpected costs reached 7.5 billion euros. Blades are these giant composite structures where the increase of the length generates an exponential increase of weight and mass. Any deviation of weight in a blade can represent a change in the stiffness, causing changes in uh, these deflections. Now, the reason is that uh, there is a manual uh, manufacturing process uh, on, this, on these blades. And a small deviation of the manufacturing process will generate these uh, extra um, loads and vibrations on the blades. Although this is normally calibrated with balances weights, uh, there's always some deviations on the structural behavior. Adding this to the structural, uh, to the complexity of wind will generate complex load patterns. That is critical to monitor if we want to keep maximized performance uh, over the lifetime, still with low operational costs. Now, there are solutions in the market. Current state-of-the-art monitors blade strains uh, with fiber optic sensors at the root level. But this is dependent from OEM designs uh, to bring the most value from this data. On the other hand, we also have uh, laser um, blade monitoring systems. Using optical uh, lasers is also an alternative uh, uh, solution. But it lacks information from the tip position, which is critical to get the full understanding, special on these uh, giant offshore blades. Our solution aims to create a full digital twin of the rotor through reliable monitoring blade deflections. This data will allow us to convert the rotor into a giant animal meter and understand the impact of the wind on blade loads. Let's see how it works. So fiber cell shape sensing technology allows to identify structural difference and deviations from each blade without the need for knowing the blade design uh, from the OEM. This feature aims to detect extra loads and underperformance causes to prevent failures and help to reduce operational costs. The technology is based on, on the full length fiber optic sensor that measures the shape in 3D, which means flapwise, edgewise, and we can de detect the torsion also, reproducing the shape of the blade while in operation. Optimally, this can be installed during the manuf manufacturing process or retrofitted into existing blades. So this is the, the, how the uh, sensor is uh, built. It uses the robustness of re and, and reliability of co a composite beam while using the accuracy and resolution of fiber optic technology. The four parallel fiber optic cores allows for the shape calculation in 3D and temperature compensation. The sensor is fixed to the root using uh, uh, it as the initial axis and reconstructing the shape from this initial position. Uh, 
Calibration is tested after the manufacturing process and uh, after the installation uh, on the blades. Let's see the, the, the forces on, on the sensor. On the left side, you can see the stresses of the sensor during flapwise deflection. So more stresses on the top or on the bottom. On the right side, you can see the difference of stresses along uh, and during edgewise uh, deformations of the blades. Now we've been carrying out uh, some laboratory tests to understand the accuracy and resolution. Um, and this has been developed in our, in our lab and it has been demonstrating the ability to measure displacements in the order of millimeters at the tip position. Fatigue tests has also been carried out to prove the reliability along several million of cycles. The end result will be what you can see here, the full shape from the root to the tip on flap or edgewise deflection for each time stem. We can also analyze the tip position along uh, the time history. In resume, what we bring uh, is uh, the result of the shape uh, along the, the, the blade from the root to the tip against what exists right now, which is the stresses along certain points uh, of the blades. Measuring the deflection of each blade continuously allows fiber cell to bring unique data to the industry in order to pave the way for performance and operations improve on the wind industry. So let's see, the value is created when encountering uh, small deviations from standard behaviors during operation. These deviations can be considered uh, to plan for predictive maintenance or calculate the residual uh, lifetime of this component, uh, on, on this case, the blades. We have an uh, innovative and very talented team uh, with, of structural and data engineers with expertise from the wind industry. And we are currently undergoing pilots on bench tests and preparing a wind turbine operational tests to demonstrate the value proposition of having fiber cell technology on a wind turbine. We are improving measurements to help improve the competitiveness of the wind industry on generating renewable energy. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am Javier Alvarez, Concrete Tower Business Unit Director, part of the Nordes Group. I will try during this session to give you an overview of the concept of mobile factories that we have successfully developed during the last 10 years. For those who are not familiar with the Concrete Tower, let me briefly explain it. The Concrete Tower is composed What if we could monitor the full condition and performance of each of these rotor blades anytime? Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Pinto. I'm the founder of FiberSail and we are making this possible. At FiberSail, we believe that blade deflection monitoring will pave the way for a far more competitive uh, wind industry. These giant blades have huge deflections, but if these deflections differ from each blade, it will cause extra loads and vibrations contributing to underperformance, failures, and unexpected maintenance. Last year, these unexpected costs reached 7.5 billion euros. Blades are these giant composite structures where the increase of the length generates an exponential increase of weight and mass. Any deviation of weight in a blade can represent a change in the stiffness, causing changes in uh, these deflections. Now, the reason is that uh, there is a manual uh, manufacturing process uh, on, this, on these blades. And a small deviation of the manufacturing process will generate these uh, extra um, loads and vibrations on the blades. Although this is normally calibrated with balances weights, uh, there's always some deviations on the structural behavior. Adding this to the structural, uh, to the complexity of wind will generate complex load patterns. That is critical to monitor if we want to keep maximized performance uh, over the lifetime, still with low operational costs. Now, there are solutions in the market. Current state-of-the-art monitors blade strains uh, with fiber optic sensors at the root level. But 
this is dependent from OEM designs uh, to bring the most value from this data. On the other hand, we also have uh, laser um, blade monitoring systems. Using optical uh, lasers uh, is also an alternative uh, uh, solution. But it lacks information from the tip position, which is critical to get the full understanding, special on these uh, giant offshore blades. Our solution aims to create a full digital twin of the rotor through reliable monitoring blade deflections. This data will allow us to convert the rotor into a giant animal meter and understand the impact of the wind on blade loads. Let's see how it works. So fiber cell shape sensing technology allows to identify structural difference and deviations from each blade without the need for knowing the blade design uh, from the OEM. This feature aims to detect extra loads and underperformance causes to prevent failures and help to reduce operational costs. The technology is based on, on the full length fiber optic sensor that measures the shape in 3D, which means flapwise, edgewise, and we can de detect the torsion also, reproducing the shape of the blade while in operation. Optimally, this can be installed during the manuf manufacturing process or retrofitted into existing blades. So this is the, the, how the uh, sensor is uh, built. It uses the robustness of re and, and reliability of co a composite beam while using the accuracy and resolution of fiber optic technology. The four parallel fiber optic cores allows for the shape calculation in 3D and temperature compensation. The sensor is fixed to the root using uh, uh, it as the initial axis and reconstructing the shape from this initial position. Calibration is tested after the manufacturing process and uh, after the installation uh, on the blades. Let's see the, the, the forces on, on the sensor. On the left side, you can see the stresses of the sensor during flapwise deflection. So more stresses on the top or on the bottom. On the right side, you can see the difference of stresses along uh, and during edgewise uh, deformations of the blades. Now we've been carrying out uh, some laboratory tests to understand the accuracy and resolution. Um, and this has been developed in our, in our lab and at, has been demonstrating the ability to measure displacements in the order of millimeters at the tip position. Fatigue test has also been carried out to prove the reliability along several million of cycles. The end result will be what you can see here, the full shape from the root to the tip on flap or edgewise deflection for each time stem. We can also analyze the tip position along uh, the time history. In resume, what we bring uh, is uh, the result of the shape uh, along the, the, the blade from the root to the tip against what exists right now, which is the stresses along certain points uh, of the blades. Measuring the deflection of each blade continuously allows fiber cell to bring unique data to the industry in order to pave the way for performance and operations improve on the wind industry. So let's see, the value is created when encountering uh, small deviations from standard behaviors during operation. These deviations can be considered uh, to plan for predictive maintenance or calculate the residual uh, lifetime of this component, uh, on, on this case, the blades. We have an uh, innovative and very talented team uh, with, of structural and data engineers with expertise from the wind industry. And we are currently undergoing pilots on bench tests and preparing a wind turbine operational tests to demonstrate the value proposition of having fiber cell technology on a wind turbine. We are improving measurements to help improve the competitiveness of the wind industry on generating renewable energy. Thank you for your attention. Hi, good afternoon. By way of introduction, I'm Tash from Lake Parim and I'm going to be talking to you about our power box. Um, unfortunately, I won't be talking, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions via email, which we'll give to you at the end. Uh, okay, first things first. What is power box and what has it got to do with wind energy? In short, it's a modular data 
sensor that monetizes surplus wind energy at the source. It does this by taking curtailed energy and transforming it into computing power, which can be delivered to end users over the internet. Again, in a nutshell, this means that wind turbines can be used more efficiently with less wasted energy. Okay, let's make that a little bit less abstract. Let's take a step back. Why do we need power box? Well, this comes down to two big problems faced by renewable energy generators. Number one, while wind energy is variable, demand for power isn't. The energy production depends on the weather, which we can't control, so we can't just turn power output up or down according to the grid's needs. Number two, variable renewable energy is not dispatchable. This means that no easy way exists to redirect the energy to the end users who actually need it. So, in periods of low demand, not all of the power can be used or sold. As a result, wind farms are left to deal with all sorts of monetization challenges. Uh, I mean, firstly, on a windy day, what are you going to do with all that excess energy? And the obvious response is, well, store it. Um, and this is currently the best solution that we've got. The thing is, adding energy storage assets increases the effective cost of producing electricity. And it doesn't take a genius to understand the maths either. If you're adding the cost of storing the energy, of course it's going to be more expensive than the generation costs on their own. So where does this leave us? Storage alone isn't a financially viable solution to the problem. Instead, the energy that's been produced has got to be used or sold. The real answer here lies in matching energy supply with the demand load. But of course, matching supply to demand is one of the greatest challenges facing the renewable sector. So when demand is low, wind turbines are forced to curtail their output to the grid, either by storing excess energy locally, or in most cases, halting production entirely. So this is a lot of wasted, wasted potential, lots of idle turbines. But here we go. This is where the power box comes in. As I said, Powerbox is a mobile data centre, which is essentially a shipping container placed on site at the wind farm and contains high powered IT equipment. The surplus energy is diverted from the wind turbines to Powerbox behind the meter. So this means it doesn't affect the wind farm's grid fulfillment. We're able to bypass the grid, avoiding costs of transmission and distribution, and this lets us skip over wholesale energy prices. In other words, this lets us monetize energy at the source that would otherwise go to waste. And we provide an additional revenue stream decoupled from the energy market. Right, so you're thinking, amazing, greater income for the wind power industry, less energy wasted, finally utilizing more of this renewable resource with less idle turbines. Um, but what about problem number two? What about dispatching the energy? It's all well and good taking surplus energy, but now we've got to get it to the end users who actually need it. So this is how we do it. As a summary, um, the IT equipment inside Powerbox runs energy intensive HPC applications for end users. That's high performance computing applications. These might be companies or universities that use machine learning, rendering, simulation, image analysis, anything power intensive that rather than operating in-house, they can access from us by the cloud. At Lake Perim, we design, build and operate these HPC systems. We work with the renewable energy operators to provide sustainable computing infrastructure and deliver this output over the internet. I.e. we're able to transform low value clean electrical power into high value computing power and bridge this gap between wind energy generation and the demand. Okay, so to recap, problem number one, we know wind energy is variable, sometimes there's excess, but now there's somewhere for this curtailed energy to go so it doesn't go to waste. Problem number two, renewable energy isn't dispatchable, um, but now there's a way to get it to the end users who require a ton, and now they're using green energy. If the benefits and the importance of this weren't already evident, let's talk about what this means for renewable energy generators. Deploying Powerbox on-site increases the efficiency of wind farms by providing an instant energy sink in periods of low demand. This can improve their financial profile by monetizing energy that would otherwise be going to waste. On a larger scale, this supports further investment and helps you decarbonize the grid. And obviously for HPC users, um, which includes organizations involved in medical science, aerospace, environment, they can save space, operate on cheaper energy and reduce their carbon footprint. 
Okay, so in summary, Powerbox sources low value clean energy from wind farms, transforms it and sells it as high value sustainable computing power delivered over the internet. This way, Lake Prune can make a real contribution to increase the efficiency of wind farms, diversify revenue streams in the wind energy industry and help to decarbonise the grid. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions or would like to learn any more about Lake Prune or Powerbox, feel free to drop me an email um, which is on screen now or take a peek at our, peek at our website. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jose Luis Dominguez Garcia, the Project System Power Systems Group Leader from IREC. And today I'm going to talk to you about the CoreWin project. Okay. <coughs> the CoreWin project is an EU funded. Uh, CoreWin stands for Cost Reduction and Increased Performance of Floating wind technology. It's a project that uh, will take 42 months. We are currently on the month 15 and we have, as you can see, different web pages and social media where you can find us. The project um, uh, partners and consortium uh, are covering the whole value chain of floating wind. Okay. Uh, in addition, we have uh, a quite European-wide view of the technology. The key project objective is really to advance uh, on the cost-effective and innovative solutions in order to ensure the LCOE reduction. So we are trying to mm, follow up different innovations that will help us to this goal. Uh, one of the key things that floating uh, offshore wind it's uh, fighting to are its high cost, the problem of reliability and industrialization. In that way Corwin will try to produce different advances and outcomes in order to help us to overcome the challenges. In order to do so, the project aims to provide different impacts helping to reduce the LCOE. First of all, we are increasing or reducing the LCOE by increasing the size of the, the turbine. So we are working with larger ones, among others. The project outcomes will provide different uh, numerical tools, uh, which can be like reference models, the 15 megawatt, different floater models, also different operational and design tools like Bing Toolbox, Digital Twins and Operational Maintenance Planning as well as economic tools like Optimization and LC LCOE Cost Tool. The project uh, focused on concrete based floaters okay, as they can be the semi-sub from a Cobra Active Float and the SPART wind grid from UPC. With this, we believe that we can foster further the cost reduction and even the technology extension. Uh, in order to validate the development within the project, we have selected three different sites with different uh, weather requirements, water depths, etc., which can help us in order to see if that floaters are really worthwhile at different uh, events. Some uh, of the key advances that you can see is that uh, we have one of our partners, DTU, have been uh, actively collaborating on the development of the 15 megawatt wind turbine and this is the one that we are using as reference for our development. So we, we are scaling up everything to 15 megawatts. The project as previously uh, presented uh, is working on two different floater technologies, semi-soup and spar. So once we have selected the different sites, we are developing the floater models, scaling up those to withstand a 15 megawatt turbines in order to understand their loads and their dynamics. Uh, one of the key advances of the project is 
um, enabling the integrated development and optimization of mooring and cables. Usually that systems and technologies has been developed completely independently and in that case we are trying to ensure that collaboration in order to optimize the cost and efficiency. One of, uh, of the additional parts that are quite relevant on our floating wind project, uh, Corwin, is the operational maintenance. So there are lots of things to learn and lots of things to improve on here. And we have started with a state of the art. So we have been talking about cables, moorings, workability, accessibility, and so on. And we have find out different interesting things. In addition, we have been uh, starting to evolve one uh, existing tool for floating wind uh, design, which uh, was the forward from a Life 50 Plus project, uh, in order to have one more flexible and advanced tool. Okay. In addition, the project will have some hardware in the loop uh, simulations, as well as some real life and uh, field testing. So we are sending certain materials that will be on the moorings, on the dynamic cables, to the El Vocal testing site in order to see how the biofueling uh, appears and how they behave on real field. In addition, we are not only making the typical developments that we, but we are trying to go to the different breakthroughs as it can be shared anchors, shared moorings, uh, dynamic cables, um, for example, uh, connecting directly without touching the seabed, etc. Um, one of the key fields that is also quite relevant on Corwin project is the di digitalization. In that project, as previously stated, we aim to develop some digital twin uh, models, for example, machine learning models for operational maintenance, uh, as well as advanced wind farm control. We are expecting to have MPC controllers for loss load optimization and then life extension. In addition, we are also working on optimal layout in order to minimize the cost by considering um, the dynamic cabling the connection, the mooring, and all the restrictions that we may have. Okay. And finally, we are also starting to develop one uh, building information model toolbox for floating. So the idea here is to have 3D models with different information layers that will help us to foster and speed up any design and installation process. So thank you for the attention. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact me on my email okay and uh, as well as please stay tuned and follow us on our social media and our web page and so on thank you good afternoon ladies and gentlemen my name is jose manuel martin i am a researcher in the field of material science and i work in ceit which is a Spanish research center located in the city of San Sebastian. I was the coordinator of the European project in Ohio. Today, I am presenting the main results of this project. This slide shows the index that I will follow during my presentation. The motivation to propose new hire was to reduce the consumption of rare earths in wind turbine generators. The use of rare earth magnets in wind turbine generator has grown in the last decades due to some important advantage of this technology. However, there are some problems linked to the use of these magnets, as for example, a strong dependence on China for supply, a high price, and some challenges related with recycling. In order to mitigate these problems, New High studied the following solutions. The development of new permanent magnets composition without heavy rare earths, that is dysprosium or terbium, with a cobalt and without gallium, the improvement of the properties of present bonded magnets by using new magnetic powders and optimizing the molding process, the replacement of the sintered magnets by bonded magnets without increasing the total volume of magnetic material, which in practice reduced the total content of rare earths, the optimization of the design of wind turbine generators for bonded magnets, 
bonded magnets have lower magnetic properties than sintered magnets, but they can be shaped into more complex geometries. This makes possible new designs of rotor that are more efficient and can partially compensate for the use of lower performance magnets. New Hire has also developed new recycling processes to increase the recovery ratio of magnets and critical raw materials. These recycling processes consider the recycling of both sintered and bonded magnets. They involve direct rows to reuse the neodymium iron bore alloy and indirect rows to recover the critical raw materials. We have manufactured magnet samples and we have measured their properties to ensure the technical viability. And we have performed a complete life cycle assessment to ensure the environmental sustainability of new production and recycling processes. The NOHAR consortium was formed by 10 different organizations, universities, research centers, and companies from six different countries. Next, I will present some of the results of the project. CEIT, the University of Birmingham, and Aichi Steel have obtained a laboratory scale a new anisotropic powder using as precursor isotropic gas atomized powder. This new powder has magnetic properties that are superior to some commercial powders. The University of Birmingham has optimized the processing parameters for producing large batches of recycled powder from end of light sintered magnets. Overall, the average coercivity and remanence values of this powder are superior to some commercial powders as well. Partners have used this powder to produce bonded magnets by compression and injection molding. Collector have produced anisotropic test samples by injection molding using recycled powder. CEIT, the University of the Basque Country, and the University of Birmingham have conducted microstructural and magnetic characterization. As you can see in the figure on the right, the powder has an ultrafine grain size, which explains why the magnetic properties are so good. Collector has performed magnetic, mechanical, and corrosion tests. In general, the results obtained from this test show that the new powders can be used to manufacture magnets with properties comparable to commercial magnets. Fraunhofer has carried out cyclic and fatigue testing, studying the interaction between mechanical and magnetic properties. The conclusion is that no magnetic loss could be observed while the bonded magnets are mechanically loaded in a dynamic way. INDAR provides the design requirements of the wind turbine generator. CDOUT and CIT did the electromagnetic, thermal and mechanical design of the new generator. The initial machine was a high-speed wind turbine generator with sintered magnets. The new design with new higher bonded magnets exhibit similar performance with 30% reduction of neodymium iron boron alloy. That is, bonded magnets are worse than sintered magnets, but allow new possibilities in terms of machine design that compensate largely for their lower properties. Fraunhofer has developed a design concept with which the fatigue and the magnetic properties of magnetic components can be calculated. The design concept used both finite elements modeling and experimental data of fatigue tests. The results show that the new high magnets in the investigated hard speed design of the generator are not fatigue critical components. Manufacturing a wind turbine generator was out of the scope of the project, but we wanted to test experimentally the idea of using bonded magnets and complex designs instead of sintered magnets in a real electric machine. The University of Birmingham produced 5 kg of anisotropic recycled powder to manufacture a small electric motor prototype. Collector manufactured and tested the prototype that you can see in the screen. No high bonded madness with nearly a half of the remnants of the standard sintered madness achieved 85% of the induced voltage in the rotor. As you can see in this slide, the Catholic University of Leuven has developed four new processes for the recycling of neodymium iron boron magnets and the recovery of critical raw materials. 
Junifi and Sidout had compared the state of the art manufacturing technology with the new alternative taking into account recycling. The conclusion is that manufacturing and recycling of new hydro bonded magnets are sustainable and reduce present impacts. Recycling can potentially reduce raw materials consumption. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you require further information on any of these topics, please Hello, uh, welcome to the presentation about the Horizon 2020 eShape project and its uh, Showcase 3, Pilot 3 on merging offshore wind products. eShape, formerly known as EuroGEO Showcases, is a four-year project which kicked off in May 2019. It involves 54 partner institutes aiming to develop 27 different pilots or services based on Earth observation data spanning seven thematic categories or else known as showcases. These showcases have been specifically identified to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Agreement on Decreasing Global Warming, and also the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. In order to tackle such challenges, eShape utilizes Earth observation resources to establish Europe's contribution to the Group on Earth Observation, which is a partnership of more than 100 national governments and organizations, promoting the use of coordinated, comprehensive and sustained Earth observation data to inform decisions and actions relevant to the benefit of humankind. The showcases identified in eShape cover a wide range of applications from agriculture and climate to health, disasters and renewable energy. This latter one consists of three pilots, two on solar energy and the third pilot is on offshore wind energy. The aim of this third pilot on offshore winds is to provide earth observation based services stemming from available offshore wind products covering the European seas. Potential users can be offshore wind farm developers and operators, consultants, researchers and policy makers. Many existing studies have shown how earth observation winds can be used for analyzing long term wind characteristics over large areas and thus how they can serve as roadmaps for climatological conditions to support decision making for installation of in situ measurement stations like meteorological masts and for identifying areas to perform higher resolution model experiments. The overall aim is to optimize and advertise existing and newly developed satellite based services for offshore wind energy by adding value to satellite observations and tailor them to the needs of the wind energy industry through a co-design analysis together with potential users. Satellite-derived winds are typically retrieved over the ocean and refer to 10 meters above the surface. Traditionally, they have been provided by scatterometers and synthetic aperture radars operating in the microwave range of the electromagnetic spectrum and in particular measuring the radar backscatter from the very small scale waves or roughness elements on the ocean surface. These small scale waves and hence the radar backscatter signal are for a well-defined range of wind speeds in equilibrium with the actual wind speed. And based on empirical algorithms, this wind speed can be inferred from the radar backscatter. The different types of sensors have complementary advantages in terms of their spatial resolution and coverage, their temporal resolution, but also their availability. For example, SAR winds have higher spatial resolution and good coastal coverage, yet an a priori wind direction is needed to infer the wind speed. 
ACECAT winds have a lower spatial resolution of 12.5 km, but combined with a global consistent temporal coverage of both wind speed and direction. And finally, while ACECAT winds are readily available from the Organization for European Meteorological Satellites, until recently SAR winds were not readily available. At DTU Wind Energy, we have been actually retrieving SAR winds since the Envisat ASAR era back in 2002. Uh, these retrieved winds are available from a dedicated website where everyone can browse data by area and time period. And for added functionality, one can easily create a free user account. Uh, such added functionality actually involves downloading the data files or preview files where detailed views of instantaneous wind fields can actually reveal details to the level of individual wind farms or clusters of wind farms, as shown in this picture here. Especially when comparing instantaneous SAR winds, uh, like in the right panel here, with simulated winds from a mesoscale atmospheric model, like in the left panel, the added benefit of measurements in high resolution is highlighted, where small-scale features and topographic effects are clearly visible, like the example from the western part of Crete in the Aegean Sea. Another application is to infer the mean long-term wind from ASCAT, like in the left panel, and SAR, like in the right panel, where the spatial variability is evident, for example, the higher mean Atlantic winds compared to the Mediterranean winds, the impact of topographic features and sheltering effects, along with speed-up effects and persistent wind patterns like the Mistral wind. Satellite-based mean wind speeds at 100 meters through extrapolation can be cal calculated using specifically developed methods. When such extrapolated mean winds from ASCAT in the left and SAR in the middle of this slide are visually compared to simulated winds in the right panel, the superiority in spatial resolution becomes visible where the higher spatial variability of satellite winds is maintained even after extrapolation compared to the smooth features of the simulated winds. Outcomes of such analysis are demonstrated in a dedicated website where users can view the derived resource maps at various atmospheric levels along with the ASCAT provided wind direction in the form of wind roses. And these features will be enhanced in the new version of this service with added parameters as the power density and Weibull analysis. The data availability or sample size can also uh, help identify advantages between the different sensors where, for example, ASCAT provides samples in the order of uh, 6,000 or more and SAR in the order of 1,500. And exactly this is the rationale based on which uh, the new uh, pilot is, uh, is conceived. And the idea is to merge scatterometer and SAR winds in a unified wind resource product, which is currently under development and will be the newest addition to the existing service. Finally, a small demo service is uh, using significant wave heights from altimeters to develop monthly cl climatological features. And this service can also be expanded uh, at a later stage or upon request. Thank you for your attention and please don't hesitate to ask any questions through the chat section.